Welcome to Attitude. I'm Mary Arnott, host and producer. In this episode, I am changing the format of the show. Instead of interviewing a guest on a specific topic, I'm going to do book reviews and share with you my opinion on some of my favorites. There are definitely books with attitude, of course. I'm a member of a book club in Hopkinton. Not long ago, I did a show about book clubs with Nancy Jennison and Ronak Hussein, where we talked about different types of clubs, how to form one, how to select books, etc. If you haven't seen the show, you can watch it on hcam.tv if you are interested. Of course, the ultimate goal of a book club is to read books. As I tell you about some of the ones I liked and why, I promise not to give away the ending or say too much so as not to reveal the entire story. But I hope to say enough about each one to encourage you to read it. All of them are either available at the town library, in print and digital form, or can be ordered online. My preference is still to check out the printed version from the library. I guess I'm old fashioned that way. The first book is written by Chris Cleave, called Little Bee. Don't be fooled by the title. It's definitely not a children's book, nor is it about bees. When I started reading Little Bee, after a few pages, I wasn't sure I wanted to continue. I decided to keep reading anyway, and within a few more pages, the book had pulled me in and wouldn't let me go. It's a story of courage and tragedy with such twists and turns that you won't want to put it down. The story is told from the perspective of the two main characters, a young girl from Nigeria nicknamed Little Bee, and Sarah, a woman from London, and how their lives intersect in the most unusual ways, more than once. This book is intense, and though it is fiction, when reading it, it seemed very real and tragically possible. If you are looking for light reading, this isn't it. If you are looking for a well-written and captivating story, Little Bee will not disappoint you. But be prepared to be shocked and shed some tears. Here's a couple of pages from the story. Okay, this is Sarah speaking. It was cold in the church. I listened to the vicar saying, where, O death, is thy sting? I stared at the lilies and smelled the sweet accusation of them. God, how I wish I had paid more attention to Andrew. How to explain to my son that the warning signs were so slight, that disaster, when it is quite sure of its own strength, will announce itself by hardly moving its lips. They say that in the hour before an earthquake, the clouds hang laden in the sky, the wind slows to a hot breath, and the birds fall quiet in the trees of the town square. Yes, but these are the same portents that precede lunchtime, frankly. If we overreact every time the wind eased up, we would forever be laying down under the dining room table when we really should be laying the plates on top of it. Would my son accept that this is how it was with his father? The hairs on my arms went up, but I had a household to run. I never understood that he was actually going to do it. All I would honestly be able to say is that I woke up with, some, with the phone ringing and my body predicting some event that had yet to happen, although I never imagined it would be so serious. Charlie had still been asleep. Andrew picked up the phone in the study quickly before the noise of the ringing could wake our son. Andrew's voice became agitated. I heard it quite clearly from the bedroom. Just leave me alone, he said. All of that step, stuff happened a long time ago, and it wasn't my fault. The trouble was my husband didn't really believe that. Now this is from the perspective of little B, the woman from Nigeria. One of the things I would have to explain to the girls from back home if I was telling them the story is the simple little word, horror. It means something different to the people from my village. In your country, if you are not scared enough already, you can go to watch a horror film. Afterward, you can go out to the cinema into the night, and for a little while, there's horror in everything. Perhaps there are murderers lying in wait for you at home. You think this because there is a light on in your house that you are certain you did not leave on. And when you remove your makeup in the mirror, the last thing you see is a strange look in your own eyes. It is not you. For one hour, you are haunted and you do not trust anybody. And then the feeling fades away. Horror in your country is something you take a dose of to remind yourself that you are not suffering from it. For me and the girls from my village, horror is a disease, and we are sick with it. It is not an illness you can cure yourself of by standing and letting the big red cinema seat fold itself up behind you. That would be a good trick, 
If I could do that, please believe me, I would already be standing in the foyer. I would be laughing with the kiosk boy and exchanging British one pound coins for hot buttered popcorn and saying, whew, thank the Lord, that is all over. That is the most frightening film I ever saw. And I think next time I will go see a comedy or maybe a romantic film with kissing. But the film in your memory, you cannot walk out of it so easily. Wherever you go, it is always playing. So when I say that I'm a refugee, you must understand there is no refuge. That's from Little B. The next one, speaking of tears, is a book called The Shack by Mackenzie Allen Phillips. I cried through the entire story, both grippingly sad tears and some very happy ones, because the book rips you apart before it puts you back together. The story takes you on a journey of deep tragedy and redemption, surrounding the death of a little girl named Missy and her father Max's encounter with God as he tries to understand the brutality and senselessness of his daughter's murder. The way the story is written, I wasn't sure if it would make sense at all by the ending, but I assure you that this book will shake you at your very core. Whether you believe in God or not, this book will change you. Here's a sample. Max stood on the shore, doubled over and still, trying to catch his breath. It took a few minutes before he even thought about Missy, remembering that she had been coloring in her book at the table. He walked up the bank to where he could see the campsite, but there was no sign of her. His pace quickened as he hurried to the tent trailer, calling her name as calmly as he could manage. No response. She was not there. Even though his heart skipped a beat, he rationalized that the confusion, in the confusion someone had to have seen her, probably Sarah Madison or Vicki Doucette or one of the older kids. Not wanting to appear over anxious or panicky, he found and soberly informed his two new friends that he couldn't find Missy and asked if they would each check with their families. Both quickly headed off to their respective campsites. Jesse returned to announce that Sarah had not seen Missy all that morning. He and Mac then headed for the Doucette site, but before they reached it, Emil came hurrying toward them a look of apprehension written clearly on his face. No one has seen Missy today, and we don't know where Amber is either. Maybe they're together. There was a hint of dread in Emile's question. I'm sure that's it, said Mac, trying to reassure himself and Emile at the same time. Where do you think they might be? Why don't we check the bathrooms and showers, suggested Jesse. Good idea, said Mac. I'll check the ones nearest our site, the ones my kids use. Why don't you and Emil check the ones between your sites? They nodded and Mac headed at a slow trot toward the closest showers, noticing for the first time that this was he was barefoot and shirtless. What a sight I must be, he thought, and probably would have chuckled if his mind wasn't so focused on Missy. Arriving at the restrooms, he asked a teenager emerging from the women's section if she had seen a little girl in a red dress inside, or maybe two girls. She told him that she hadn't noticed, but would look again. In less than a minute, she was back shaking her head. Thank you anyway, said Mac, and headed around the back of the building where the showers were located. As he rounded the corner, he began calling loudly for Missy. Mac could hear water running, but no one responded. Wondering if Missy might be in one of the showers, he began pounding on each until he got a response. He succeeded only in severely scaring a poor elderly lady when his door banging accidentally opened her shower stall. She shrieked, and Mac, with profuse apologies, quickly shut the door and hurried on to the next one. Six shower stalls and no Missy. He checked the men's toilet stalls and showers, trying not to think about why he would even bother looking there. She was nowhere, and he jogged back toward Emile's, unable to pray anything except Oh God, help me find her. Oh God, please help me find her. Regarding change, there are several books out that try to influence our beliefs regarding heaven and the existence of it or not. The most recent one was Proof of Heaven by a neurosurgeon, Dr. Eber Alexander. He's been making the talk circuit and his book is very popular right now. My opinion is still undecided about this book. Make no mistake, I do believe there's life after death, but I'm not necessarily convinced by Dr. Alexander's book alone. 
by all means read it, but if you read one book on the subject, I recommend 90 Minutes in Heaven by Don Piper, a Baptist minister who was declared dead by the paramedics at the scene of an accident when a semi-truck collides with him. After the paramedics declare him dead, another passing minister arrives on the scene and begins praying for Reverend Piper. I think you know where the story is going. This documented death and miraculous story of a recovery is very different than Dr. Alexander's near-death experience. I gave my copy of 90 Minutes in Heaven to my sister to read, so I won't be reading a passage from it. In any case, if you question the existence of life after death, there is so much written on this subject that by all means, start reading and draw your own conclusions. Let's talk about one more book of a religious nature, because I am truly in awe of the person it's about, and then I'll switch gears. The person is Mother Teresa. Not everyone knows, now everyone knows who she was. There are several books written by and about her. The one I really like is Mother Teresa, A Simple Path. It was written, or rather compiled, by Lucinda Vardy from several meetings with Mother Teresa not long before Mother Teresa's death in 1997. Whether you believe in God or not, or whatever your faith may be, I recommend this book because it will enlighten you, inspire you, and show you that everyone and anyone can make a difference in the world. I'm going to read a couple paragraphs and then a poem, which appears on the wall of a children's home founded by Mother Teresa in Calcutta, India. I can tell you about my past, said Mother Teresa, but I'm only a little wire. God is the power. Talk to the others, the sisters and the brothers, the people who work with them. Some are not Christians. Talk to them. You will know what it is when you see it. It is very beautiful. And another paragraph. Whatever our views of Mother Teresa as a courageous missionary or a living saint, she has made a lasting impression. We all have an opinion about her. She's been recognized as an exponent of world peace and often appeared on lists of the world's 10 most admired women. She herself has never claimed to be or to be doing anything extraordinary. And now the poem. It's entitled Anyway. People are unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you do good, people will accuse you of foolish ulterior motives. Do good anyway. If you are successful, you win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. The good you do will be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty and frankness make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spent years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. People really need to be, really need help, but may attack you if you help them. Help people anyway. Give the world the best you have and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you have anyway. That's Mother Teresa's simple path. Okay, switching to fiction again, this time to love stories. Yes, I admit, I really like reading love stories, but not superficial ones. I read two that took place primarily in Paris. The first one just prior to my trip to Paris last year, fulfilling a lifelong dream of vacationing in one of the most enticing and romantic cities in the world. Okay, yes, I recommend you visit Paris too, but back to the book. The title is The Last Time I Saw Paris by Lynn Sheen, and it's set against the backdrop of World War II. The heroine is Claire Harris Stone, a socialite who goes to Paris to escape her life that's disappointing in New York City. But boy, is her timing bad. She arrives not long before Paris is captured by the Germans. The story is one of tragedy and courage, loss and love, betrayal and triumph. The last time I saw Paris didn't win any awards, but it is very well written and with an ending that will surprise you. Here's a little introduction to Claire and her situation. Claire jerked awake as the darkness flared to bright white. A deafening boom shook the room. She wrenched free of her tangled sheets and fell from the small bed. She crawled to the window and peered into the darkness. Another flash. The balcony windows glowed scarlet, and rumbling thunder, thunder threw her to the floor. Now two red suns glowed in the distance. A stirring of explosions ripped the sky apart. Far off, crimson 
t excuse me, far off crimson towers flared into the night, lighting the graceful lines of the blacked out city like a fiery sunset. The stars were veiled by a murky gray blanket of dense smoke. The Germans were bombing Paris. She pulled herself to her feet and swung open the windows, arms hugged against her chest. An acrid breeze that smelled of cinders tugged at her thin cotton slip. Stepping outside on the small balcony, her gaze was trapped, unblinking on the destruction in the distance. She listened for the Nazi planes that must be responsible but couldn't make out the buzzing engines over the blood pounding in her ears. Another barrage and the balcony shuddered. Now several different parts of the city were ablaze. Claire cursed under her breath. Paris was for expiring like Greta Garbo and Camille in silk sheets amongst flowers and despairing lovers. Damn well not for dying alone, blown to bits. Her knees buckled and she sank to the balcony floor. A blast too large, too close, rattled her teeth. She leaned her head against the wrought iron railing, the cool metal built into her cheek. Figures crowded the street below, only their outlines visible. Their shouts sounded thin and the baritone explosions as they scurried in all directions. Who did they run to? That's the last time I saw Paris. The next book also takes place primarily in Paris. It's called The Paris Wife by Paula McLean. The book is very well written, so much so that you feel like you intimately know each of the characters. Perhaps because, although it is fiction, the story is based on real life people, Ernest Hemingway and his wife Hadley. The supporting characters also are very real, and you can easily imagine yourself sitting among them as they submerge themselves in the fast-paced lifestyle of Paris in the 1920s. Hemingway is portrayed in the way we have come to know him, complicated and intense, which also describes his marriage, marriage to Hadley. This story will have you falling in and out of love. It's captivating, intriguing, frustrating, and entertaining. It's also a warning to women who fall in love with men who are, as we say, the forbidden fruit, if you know what I mean. It may be fun and exciting to take the plunge, but was it worth it in the end? The Paris Wife is worth the read, and here's a sample why. Afterward, we lay back on the blankets and watched the stars, which were very bright everywhere above us. I feel like I'm your pet, he said, his voice warm and soft. You're mine too, my small perfect cat. Did you ever think it could be like this, the way we're happening to each other? I can do anything if I have you with me, he said. I think I could write a book. I mean, I want to, but the thing is, it could be all stupid or useless. Of course you can do it, and it will be wonderful, I said. I'm sure of it, young and fresh and strong, just like you are. It will be you. I want my characters to be just like us, just people trying to live simply and say what they really mean. We say that what we mean, but it's hard, isn't it? It might be the hardest thing of all, really being honest. Kenley says we're rushing things. He doesn't understand why I want to move into marriage when single life suits me so well. That's his prerogative. Yes, but it's ju not just him. Everyone's worried I'm going to gum up my career. Jim Campbell thinks I'm going to forget the whole point of Italy once we're hitched. Kate's not speaking to us either. Let's don't bring her up, please. Not now. All right, he said. I'm just saying that no one seems to get that I need this. I need you. He sat up and then looked into my face until I thought I might dissolve from it. I hope we'll get lucky enough to grow old together. You see them on the street, those couples who've been married so long you can't tell them apart. How'd that be? I'd love to look like you, I said. I'd love to be you. I never said anything truer. I would gladly have climbed out of my skin and into his that night because I believed that was what love meant. Hadn't I just felt us collapsing into one another? until there was no difference between us, it would be the hardest lesson of my marriage, discovering the flaw in his thinking, in this thinking. I couldn't reach into every part of Ernest, and he didn't want me to. He needed me to make him feel safe and backed up. Yes, the same way I needed him. But he also liked what, that he could disappear into his work away from me and return when he wanted to. And one more little part. It rained much of January, and once that passed, winter in Paris was stingingly cold and clear. 
Ernest had believed he could write anywhere, but after a few weeks of working in the cramped apartment, always aware of me, he found and rented a single room very nearby on Rue Descartes. For 60 francs a month, he had a garret not much bigger than a water closet, but it was perfect for his needs. He didn't want distractions and didn't have any there. His desk overlooked the unlovely rooftops and chimney pots of Paris. It was cold, but cold could keep you focused. I have one last review, and this is a nonfiction book. It's entitled Shackleton's Forgotten Men, The Untold Tragedy of the Endurance Epic by Leonard Bickle. This book may seem more for male readers only, but I think the book should be read by everyone, men and women, young and old. It's a true life gripping story of disaster, loyalty, deprivation, survival, and an adventure of a group of men in the early 19th century on an expedition to Antarctica. The tale at times is heartwarming and at times brutal. As I read this book, I could feel the extremely cold temperatures going through my bones. I could feel the hunger pains, the deprivation, and the illnesses they suffered. I also felt admiration for their bravery and perseverance, as they were determined to push on and accomplish their missions, against all odds of success or ever returning home. Read the book and ask yourself, would you have given up? Would you have ever gone on the expedition? Here's what happened to the padre that is with them. Throughout the dark, cold hours, the sleepless men could hear the padre moaning in pain, and they ached for the bitter night to end and for the light to come. When they could make a dash for the edge of the barrier to save this gentle churchman, in the early hours of the morning, he roused Ernie Wilde, and there was a feeble quality in his tone as he asked the time. When Wilde replied that it was about four o'clock and Spencer Smith demanded, have you lost your bearings? They knew he was delirious. Half an hour later, when Dick Richards sat up in his bag to end the convulsive leap of his shivering, he found that Spencer Smith was staring at him across the small tent. With fright in his voice, the Padre asked, Richie, when your heart is behaving funny, what's the best thing to do, sit up or lie down? Richards did not know the answer, but said he thought the most sensible thing would be to lie still and try to keep warm in the sleeping bag. The Padre did not speak again, and Richards thought his advice had been accepted. The silence lasted until the first pale light of the day was filtering through the green dome tent. When Richards sat up and looked across the clergyman, he could see that Spencer Smith was lying with his head back and uncovered. That faint light glimmered on the ice that had formed on his beard, his brows, and his eyelids. The Padre was very, very still. The truth came as a stab in the heart, and Dick Richards called, He's gone. I think he's gone. Shackleton's men. I think all of these men were pretty crazy to go in the first place but then maybe you have to be a little crazy to accomplish what seems impossible. For those of us a little less crazy, we get to read the books, but nonetheless we can experience the journey, if only in our imagination and appreciation for stories, people and places, both fiction and nonfiction. I hope you enjoyed the book reviews enough to read some of, the, some of these books or any others. There are so many more I could review, but so little time. Anyway, the important thing is to read whenever you have time and also to read to your children or encourage them to read. Thank you to HCAM for giving me the opportunity to do this show. And thank you for watching. See you next time. I'm Mary Arnott, signing out with Attitude. Hi, I'm Cheryl Peralt, host of the program Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM-TV. 
This show introduces you to Hopkinton residents, the many interesting people who are our neighbors, and we invite them to share stories, experiences, insights, and observations from their lives. We'd like to hear who you think should be interviewed on our program. So if you know someone that Hopkinton should get to know more about, please email me and stay tuned for more episodes of Meet Your Neighbor on EdgeCam TV. I'm Dr. Martin Kafina. Lupus is a chronic inflammatory disease of the immune system that can attack various parts of the body, such as the skin, joints, or internal organs. It has been described as America's most common, least known disease. At least one and a half million Americans have the disease, and more than 16,000 new cases are reported each year. 90% of those affected are women, with most between the ages of 15 to 44. The symptoms of lupus can vary from patient to patient, but joint pain, muscle weakness, fatigue, fever rashes, or sensitivity to sun or light are common signs of the disease. The effects of lupus can range from mild to severe, but it is a serious condition that requires constant monitoring and treatment. For more information, visit the American College of Rheumatology at rheumatology.org. Yes, we're HCAM TV, but movies also? Dive In Drive In is a new program featuring the HCAM staff's favorite B movies. Check our schedule at HCAM.TV for the next showing of some of the more forgotten films, black and white or color. Join Mike Terosian and myself as we introduce and give you some interesting facts about the cast and crews of classic movies. We hope you'll enjoy these treasured films of yesteryear. Hello, I'm Cheryl Peralt, co-producer of Wake Up and Smell the Poetry, an HCAM series honoring poetry, story, and song that takes place on the third Saturday each month before a live audience. Guest features share their art followed by an open mic with people who come from near and far. Others come to listen and be part of this warm and welcoming studio and to wake up a bit to arts and to life. You're welcome to join us and to tune in or visit our website for our weekly program. Hope you can join us.